Good evening and welcome to the Shadowlands. I'm your host, Jack Ward. Each week, myself, Andrew Dorfman, and you, dear listener, explore the soundscape universe of Shadowlands, artistry and creativity in radio drama. This theater of the mind has no limitations, no expectations beyond that of teasing the imagination and wakening the senses. Tonight we complete our bow to Lux Theater with one of the greatest Hollywood legends who ever stood tall in the saddle, John Wayne. And we'll round up the end of May with a little merriment and mayhem as we add on another episode of the indelible duo Bud Abbott and Lou Costello as they take on their own special guests, Lucille Ball and Bugs Bunny. So without further ado, dear listener, let's lift the curtain for tonight's performance. Turn the lights down low. Get comfortable as we present on the Shadowlands, Lux Theater with John Wayne, starring in the classic, Tie a Yellow Ribbon. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring John Wayne, Mel Ferrer, and Mala Powers in She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The history of the United States Cavalry is one of daring, accomplishment, and romance. And in our play tonight, She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, we present a colorful drama from its glorious past. As our stars of the RKO screen success, we present one of the most popular actors of today, John Wayne. And co-starring with him is a very versatile artist, Mel Ferrer. And one of the most beautiful young actresses in Hollywood, Mala Powers. We wish to congratulate John Wayne on receiving the Photoplay Gold Medal Award as the most popular actor of the year. And hope he'll continue to appear in such fine American pictures as John Ford's great production of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. We know the ladies have been always been color conscious, whether it was yellow ribbons in their hair or gay-flowered handkerchiefs in their pockets. And they've always depended on Lux Flakes to preserve these colors. And now, Lux with color freshener is more wonderful than ever. Here, she wore a yellow ribbon, adapted from the famous story by James Warner Bella, starring John Wayne as Captain Brittles, Mel Ferrer as Lieutenant Cohill, and Mala Powers as Olivia Dandridge. <laughs> It is 1876. Custer is dead. Custer and over 200 men of the 7th Cavalry. It's more than just a victory for the Indians. It is a signal to unite. Kiowa, Comanche, Arapaho, Sioux, and Apache. United in common war against the United States Cavalry. Our post is far to the south of the Little Bighorn. Fort Stark, isolated. Kind of lonely for some, I guess. Anyway, this day started like a thousand others before it, with Sergeant Quincannon standing in the doorway of my cabin. Good morning, sir. 542, sir. 541. And a lovely morning it is, Captain Darlin. Coated in blazes. News? As follows, sir. Mrs. Jameson had her baby. The stagecoach run from here to Sudrose Wells has been discontinued. And there's a dispatch rider in from the Desert Patrol. Well? Private Mackenzie got himself shot, sir. Boy or a girl for Mrs. Jamison? <laughs> a little trooper, sir. When does the stage stop running? Finish, sir. No more stagecoach, sir. Mackenzie? Is he bad off? No, sir. A uh, good man, Quinn Cannon. He'll make corporal in five or six years. Yes, sir. Well, scratch another day off that calendar. Just six more days, Captain Darlin. 
Six more days and you're retired, sir. I am well aware of that, Quinn Cannon. Uh, the army will never be the same without you, sir. The army is always the same. The sun and the moon change, but the army has no seasons. But here you are in your prime, sir, and they're turning you out to pasture. That's a willful abuse of the taxpayer's money, sir. The only tax you ever worried about was on whiskey. I beg your pardon, sir. I guess you have a reason for busting in, Mr. Cohill. Sir, Sergeant Tyree's just entered the post. He's got half the Paradise River Patrol with him, sir, and the paymaster's coach. Keep talking, mister. Well, the paymaster's dead, sir. Gunshot wounds. Dead when Tyree found him, sir. Where? Near Red Beauty, said, sir. The money box is gone. Mm, Gunshot wounds. Yes, sir. Though the coach is stuck full of arrows, too. I'll tell Sergeant Tyree to report at once to Major Alshard's quarters. Take over morning inspection, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. And tell Tyree to bring one of those arrows with him. Now, let me look at that arrow again. Yeah. You sure it's not Kyle, Captain? No, and it's not Comanche nor Arapaho either, Major. Not with those color bands. Sir, with your permission, I... All right, Tyree, put in your two cents worth. Well, sir, these arrows with the yellow, white, and red bands are the signs of the southern Cheyenne. And I've seen bannocks and snakes with the same color. Yes, sir, but looking at the clan mark, this mark right here, it's the sign of the dog. Then tell me, what in blazes would Cheyenne be doing this far south? That ain't my department, sir. Alert the post, Sergeant. Yes, sir. And get some rest. Thank you, sir. Well, Nathan, any ideas? Mm, I'll go out in the morning, pick up the patrols, and drive those Cheyenne back where they belong. Let me think on it, Nathan. I'll let you know later. The day wore on. Now, life within a post isn't all spit and polish. Take Lieutenant Pennell, for instance, and the Major's niece. Pennell's got a buckboard, and it's a fine day for a drive. Only he's having a little trouble at the gates. You heard me, Mr. Pennell. The post is on alert. Nobody's leaving the ground. Oh, now, wait a minute, Cohill. You heard me. Sorry to spoil your outing, Miss Dandridge. Sorry, indeed. Because I wouldn't trust you to take me on a picnic last Sunday. Now you're hazing Mr. Pennell. You just drive right on through, Ross. If you don't, I will. You touch those reins and I'll slap you in the guardhouse. You wouldn't dare. Someone placing you under arrest, Miss Dandridge? It's Lieutenant Cohill, Captain. He suddenly decided that he can order me around. Sir, I was merely following orders. I believe you interrupted the lady, Mr. Cohill. He certainly did. Now, I don't want to make a scene, Captain. But First Lieutenant Cohill has made up his mind that Second Lieutenant Pennell hasn't rank enough to be seen in my company. Sir, if I now could I just... you're interrupting. You... Yes, sir. Any further complaint, Miss Dandridge? Complaint? Oh, I'm not complaining, Captain. Aha. Uh-huh. Mr. Cohill, wipe that grin off your face and state your case. Sir, I have denied Mr. Pennell permission to leave the post. Mm-hmm. And for what purpose did you wish to leave the post, Mr. Pennell? Picnicking, sir. Picnicking? Miss Dandridge? Where? In St. Louis? Oh, no, sir. Just up at the waterfall, sir. But I'm sorry. Never to... apologize, I... mister. It is a sign of weakness. Mr. Cohill, I see no reason why Mr. Pennell should not go picnicking. Very good, sir. Thank you, Captain. But Miss Dandridge, Mr. Cohill was quite right in denying you permission to leave under the present emergency. If you will be so kind as to get out of the buckboard. Oh, but really. Your arm, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Pennell, you may proceed with your picnic. This way, Miss Dandridge. Pass Lieutenant Pennell. Yes, sir. Where'd you say you were holding your picnic? I'll tell you where. At Delmonico's in New York about two months from now. With Olivia, see? And I won't be wearing any blue suit either, bub. Get it! The Major sent for me early that evening. He had made up his mind. I guess there's no other course to take, Nathan. Find those Cheyennes and push them back. Oh, uh, by the way, here's the last report on Custer's outfit. 212 men, Nathan. Headquarters expects a hard and bloody winter. Sitting bull preaching a holy war. Uh, I want you to take every precaution. These names. George Armstrong Custer. Tom Custer. Boston Custer. Calhoun. Cook. Yes, I expect you knew most of them. I expect I did. Harrington, Keogh, Miles Keogh. Yes, Mac. A hard and bloody winter. Oh, uh, Nathan, those flowers over there, Abby picked them. 
She thought maybe for Mary's grave. Oh, well, I was figuring to stop by there now and... Yes, I know. Never miss a day, do you? Oh, thank you for me, will you, Mac? They're real pretty flowers. Nine years, Mac. Nine years last month. or from Mary. She raised him herself. Well, only six more days to go and your old Nathan will be out of the army. Haven't decided what I'll do yet. Somehow, I just can't picture myself back there on the banks of the Wabash rocking on a front porch. No, I, I've been thinking that maybe I'd push on west to the new settlements in California. Anyway, I'm taking the troops out in the morning, some Cheyennes around, so I pick up the patrols and drive them back north. My last mission, Mary. Hard to believe, isn't it? My last... I hope I'm not intruding, Captain. Why, no, ma'am, not at all. I was just... I know. I've watched you come out here so many times. I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself this morning. You made a fool out of a couple of young lieutenants... That's never against Army regulations. Then I'm forgiven. You're forgiven. Thank you, Captain. Good night. Good night, Miss Dandridge. She's a nice girl, Mary. She reminds me of you. At dawn, the troop was mounted and ready to leave. Till Sergeant Quinn Cannon came up driving a wagon. Just what do you think you're up to, Quinn Cannon? Get out of that wagon. I'm begging your pardon, Captain Dodd, and it's orders. Major's orders. Orders? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd best be seeing about them side saddles, too, sir. Side saddles? Are you trying to tell me? I'll be at Major Alshard's quarters. All right, all right, Eddie. Hold on, Ethan. Hold on. I know. I what know. What in blazes does this mean? Side saddles. A covered wagon filled with women's junk. I can't hamper this patrol with a wagon, particularly this patrol. Nathan, I'm sending my wife and niece with you. What? They're to go as far as Sudro's Wells and take the stage east from there. This is an order. That, I want to protest that order. I expected you would. There's pen and paper, so put it in writing. I intend to. I sat up half the night with this, Nathan. I I can't keep Olivia here. She ain't on me. I'll say she ain't. For the following reason. You want some coffee? No. Yes. One, there is a party of Cheyenne raiding this territory. I have a feeling that every woman will... How many R's are there in territory? Two. Oh. Here, here's your coffee. (laughs) Poor Abby. She says everyone will think she's running away. And what about me? I'll be a bachelor all day. And in conclusion, I respectfully protest the decision of my commanding officer to saddle this troop with his female relations. Uh, one L in relation. To At me. this critical hour, signed Nathan Brittles and so forth. It sounds very good, Nathan. I'll be glad to file it. Oh, believe me, I I hate to hamstring you this way, but mm. you will take every precaution. Of course he will, dear. And how did marching through Georgia take the idea of old Iron Pants riding with him? Under protest, Abby. Written protest, Abby, of course. It's always my pleasure to escort old Iron Pants. Well, as long as you're going along with us. Abby, that is the dad-blamedest outfit I ever did see. Quinn Cannon's old britches. A little baggy, I suppose, Nathan. But they'll do for the trail. Where's Olivia? Is she ready? She's been ready for an hour. She's probably outside with one of your lieutenants. Well, kiss the old man of yours and say goodbye. Time we get out of here. <laughs> and I hope you approve of my uniform, Mr. Cohill. It's very becoming, ma'am. And I notice you're wearing a yellow ribbon. Well? For uh, Fennell, huh? How do you know it isn't for you, mister? I'd be very happy if it were for me. Very happy indeed. Morning. Trooper Dandridge reporting, sir. Well, and a proper trooper, too, and right pretty, don't you think, Mr. Cohill? I do indeed, sir. And a yellow ribbon, Miss Dandridge. Do you know what that means in the cavalry? A sweetheart. It does? Who's it for? Why, for you, Captain, of course. For me, huh? (laughs) 
I'll make these young bucks jealous yet. I brought you a mount, Olivia. May I help you? Thank you, Mr. Pennell. I, uh, I hope you're wearing that yellow ribbon for me, ma'am. Why, who else would it be for? Hurry up, Aunt Abby. They'll be leaving without it. So we left the post. Just another routine mission. Oaks waving goodbye, kids yelling, dogs barking. Only one thing in particular caught my eye. As we rode past the store, I saw Mr. Rinders, the sutler, in the back of the stable. He was hitching up his buckboard. Some hours later on the trail. Sergeant Tyree reporting, sir. At ease, Tyree. Well, like you told me, sir, I took cover till Rinders left the post. I've been trailing him ever since. He went southeast, Captain, about a mile below the painted pole. Mm. There's two men waiting for him in a wagon. You recognize them? No, sir. And it didn't seem prudent to inquire. Now, what do you suppose they were doing that far south? And why did Mr. Rinders leave the post in the first place? He's a storekeeper, sir. That's right. Licensed to sell merchandise to folks all over this territory. Only the post was on alert, Mr. Tyree. So I ask you again. What do you suppose Mr. Rinders and two strangers were doing that far south? Well, sir, I reckon that ain't my department, sir. Yeah. Take a point, Tyree. We'll probably pick him up on the next go-around. Romantic, isn't it, Mr. Andridge? Guide arms gaily fluttering, bronze men lustily singing, horses prancing, and bunions aching. Must you always be so vulgar, Mr. Cohill? Well, the cavalry doesn't go in for refinements, Miss Sandridge. Cavalry? This ridiculous business of dismounting and walking every hour or so, you might as well be in the infantry. Well, we soon would be if we didn't ease these mounts. Why don't you ride in the wagon with Mrs. Olshaw? No, thank you. And if you don't mind, I'd like permission to ride back along the line. Why? If you must know, I'd rather share the dust back there with Mr. Pennell. Haven't you already thrown enough dust in Pennell's eyes? Why don't you give him a chance? Mr. Cohill. Yes, sir? Relieve Mr. Pennell with the rear guard. Yes, sir. Everything under control here, miss? Thank you, Captain. Everything's just fine. An hour later, Tyree found something he wanted me to see. I told Cohill, Pennell, and the bugler to tag along. Far off against the hills, a long, low cloud of dust was rising. Traveling in the same direction we are, sir. Toward Sudro's well. Uh, can you make them out, Sergeant? Looks like a rap hole, sir. Field glasses, Mr. Pennell. Yes, sir. They're moving the whole village. Wagons, lodgings, and all. Mm, yeah. Tyree, I don't know where you got your brains, but God must have given you that pair of eyes. They're Arapahoes, all right, heading the same way we are. Now, why would they be moving on Sudro's Wells? My mother didn't raise no sons to be making guesses in front of a Yankee captain, sir. Hmm. Well, I'd soon find out if... Uh, there's no use even thinking about it. We can't risk it with these women. Arapahoes? Yes, Mr. Cohill, and I don't like it. So we'll turn east, gentlemen. Give them a wide berth. But we'll lose half a day that way, sir. The ladies may miss the stage, sir. Would you rather that they missed their scalp, sir? Get back to the column, both of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Oh, shut up. By late afternoon, we reached the canyon country. With any luck, we'd be at Sudro's Wells by morning. Thought you didn't like the wagon, Miss Dandridge. You don't have to shout, Mr. Cohill. My aunt's trying to take a nap. Well, I've only got one thing to say to you. Why don't you take your hooks out of Ross Pennell? He's got the makings of a good officer. You are not his guardian, nor mine, Mr. Cohill. Well, I'm telling you just the same. Ross is a spoiled rich kid, and the Army's his only chance. So if you can't take the Army, leave him alone. Just before dusk, we reached the rim of a valley. And down below was a sight that I, likes of which I hadn't seen in years. Why, why, they're buffalo, sir. I admire your intelligence, Mr. Cohill. First time the herd's been this far south since the, uh, summer of 68. That right, Quincannon? Correct, sir. Ah, it looks just like the good old days, sir. Mm. Buffalo meat and whiskey 50 cents a gallon, sir. You ever see a buffalo, Mr. Pennell? No, sir. 
No, I doubt if the ladies have either. You may escort them as far as those rocks. The view might please them. Thank you, sir. And what's your thinking, Mr. Tyree? And don't tell me it ain't in your department. Well, Captain, if I was a young, hot blood like Red Shirt, anxious to show off before them Cheyenne dog soldiers... I'd be walking in front of one of them council for us tonight, tell them that I was the one that made the medicine that brought back the buffalo. Mm. I'd tell them how all us engines should stick together now, quit quarreling, and drive out the rest of them Yankee soldiers. That's what I'd tell them, Captain. So, of course, I'm just guessing, you understand? Mm, yeah, well, of course, now, I'm just guessing too, Sergeant, but if I was an Indian agent, maybe a licensed sutler with the name of Rinders... If I'd met up with a couple of men near Painted Post who might be gun runners, I'm guessing I'd be mighty close to that council fire of red shirts ready to do a land office business in repeating rifles. How good's that mount of yours, Tyree? Best in the troops, sir. Uh, make for the Paradise River. Pick up the rest of the patrol there, then proceed at your best pace to Sudro's Wells. Have them hold the stage for the ladies. Yes, sir. And tell them that I've... I've been delayed. <laughs> If we kept moving all night, we'd reach Sudro Wells by dawn. But just before daylight, we saw a strange glare in the horizon. That's no sunrise, Captain. That's a fire. It's the settlement, sir. Sudro's Wells is over there. Shut up, the lot of you. Ladies to the rear, Quinn Cannon. Yes, sir. First two sets of fours. Forward, you! We rode into Sudro's Wells at top speed. But all that was left was a huddle of survivors and a pile of ashes. We'd come too late. In a moment, our stars will continue with Act Two of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter, with the Lux Movie News of the Week. Reporting, John, that a Polynesian sarong has made another star. Not that pretty Deborah Paget hasn't already proved herself a star, but personally, I think 20th Century Fox did her an extra favor when they cast her in Bird of Paradise with Jeff Chandler and Louis Jordan. 17-year-old Deborah didn't climb the ladder of success. She practically flew up. But it's not surprising. She has actors aplenty on her family tree. I just wonder what her ancestors, Baron de Steger and Lord Paget, would say to that sarong. Deborah, in Technicolor, makes one of the prettiest Polynesians I've ever seen. Louis Jordan falls in love with her, but native taboos complicate their courtship. Uh, just one bit of advice, girls. Bird of Paradise doesn't have a happy ending. So take along your handkerchiefs. You'll have a lovely cry. Does Deborah wear sarongs throughout the picture? That's right. And Deborah doesn't need Paris designs to look beautiful. The studio did make one important improvement on native washing methods. They took an eight-week supply of wonderful new lux with color freshener to Hawaii where the picture was filmed. It was so important in the Technicolor shots to keep Deborah's bright Polynesian prints sharp and dramatic, they wouldn't risk any other way of washing. There's nothing in the world just like wonderful new lux with color freshener. Hollywood studios insist on it. And the stars themselves say it's more marvelous than ever. This remarkable new lux is ideal for white things. You know how often white blouses get yellowed or gray-looking. Well, new locks with color freshener keeps them dazzling white as new. Prints have such zing and snap you can hardly believe your eyes. All colors stay bright and beautiful just the way you want them. Thanks for the tip, Libby. If new locks with color freshener does that for a sarong, think what it can do for your spring prints, your summer dresses and blouses. Why don't you get a big box tomorrow? I'm sure you'll love it, just as Deborah Paget and so many Hollywood stars do. Give your washables that nice as new Lux look. Now, here's Mr. Keeley, our producer. Act two of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, starring John Wayne as Captain Brittles, Mel Ferrer as Lieutenant Cohill, and Mala Powers as Olivia. <laughs> Come 
Among the survivors at Sudro's Wells were seven men from the Paradise River Patrol under Corporal Quain. Quain had been badly wounded. Uh, Arapaho, sir, they, they jumped us at sundown yesterday, sir. Yes, well, your report can wait, Quain. Doctor, over here. I, I, I better give it to you while I can, sir. They, they had us ringed. At night, we got away. We... We made it to the relief point, sir, but you weren't there. Just Sergeant Tyree uh, alone. I wanted to be there, Corporal. We got here before midnight, and then they they closed in. Thank you. A good, clear report, Corporal. Show up in your record when you come up for that extra stripe in two or three years. Thank you, sir. Who are they, Tyree? Cheyenne dog party. About 30 Arapahoes with them. They banded up under Red here. Hmm. Well, that blows the lid, doesn't it? How many dead here? Five, sir. More and poor Sudro, one other woman, two men. Children see it? No, sir. Found them hiding in the smokehouse. Tyree, I think it's about time I did retire. Sir, um, one of the dead is Trooper Smith. Smith? Wasn't for him, sir, that a lot more of us been gone. Smith? I, uh... Served under him for more than a year, sir. Wilderness campaign. Oh, yes, I know. Mr. Cohill. Sir? Where are the women? They've rounded up the children, sir, getting them quieted down, sir. A sign of burial party, Mr. Cohill. Then I'll want this column moving again within an hour. There's a storm coming up. For who shall believe it in me shall never die. I commend to your keeping, sir, the souls of John Sudro and his wife Martha, Albert Bridges and his wife Annie, and also the soul of Rome Clay, late Brigadier General, Confederate States Army, known to his comrades here as Trooper John Smith, United States Cavalry, a gallant soldier and a Christian gentleman. Amen. Amen. Buried the dead and made ready for the journey back to Fort Stark. Captain Riddle. You will go to the rear, Miss Dandridge, where you belong. Yes, sir, I'll go. But I... I want you to know that I'm well aware that all of this is because of me. Because I wanted to see the West. Because I wasn't army enough to stay to winter. You are not quite army yet, miss. Or you'd know never to apologize. It's a sign of weakness. For what's happened, only the man who commands can be blamed. Press on me. Mission failure. Yeah, we sure missed the stage, Miss Dandridge. That's the word. Quaden's doing fine. That's the word. Quaden's doing fine. That's the word. Quaden's doing fine. What are they talking about, Mr. Cohill? Corporal Quain. The doc says he'll be all right. Oh, I'm so glad. Why? He's just another dog-faced soldier in dirty shirt blue. What's he mean to you? Did you ever dance with him at the fort? Did you ever speak to him? No, of course you didn't. Quain's not a gentleman. I've been finding that some lieutenant's bars are no guarantee of a gentleman either. You're glad about Quain, sure. But only because it puts the happy ending to the story you'll take back east to your tea parties. Well, now you can tell him you've seen it all. A real Indian fight. A man with an arrow sticking in his chest. Why do you have... That should make your tour just about perfect. If you don't mind, Miss Dandridge. Yes? Mrs. Alshard is a rough time in that wagon, helping with Quain and all. Would you spell her for a while? Certainly, Captain. Thank you. Mr. Cohill, did anyone ever take down your britches and tan your hide? Why, no, sir. That is... Yes, sir. My father, sir. With a strap. Well, I'm just old enough to be your father, bub. Now get out of here. Take a point. <laughs> ah, they'll make a fine, boisterous couple, Captain Donald, with their marriage. When I want your opinion, Quinn Cannon, yes, I'll... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any time at all. Rain let up that afternoon. And at dusk, I called a halt. We'd stop a while and rest. We needed it. All of us. 
I wouldn't go any further if I were you. Captain Brittle said we'd be here for two hours. I didn't hear him say anything about taking a walk. There's probably a hundred hostiles out there. You think that's a whippoorwill? Come on, Olivia, let's go back. I can walk alone, thank you. Olivia, please. The old man says don't ever apologize. It's a sign of weakness. But I'm sorry for everything I've said and done. Oh, honey, you know how I feel about you. Flint. Flint, if you'd only... All right, Cole Hill. Let's get her over with. Pull your blouse. You crazy, mister. Don't pull rank on me. You've been green-eyed ever since she put that yellow ribbon on. Button up that shirt, mister. Ross, please. You can sneer all you want to, but you keep your paws off my girl. All right, mister. I'll accommodate you. Ross, no, no! Button your shirt, mister Pennell. I thought better of you. Four years out here and still acting like a wet-eared cadet on the Hudson. What is this all about, Mr. Cohill? Sir, I must decline to answer, respectfully. Mr. Cohill, it is a bitter thing indeed to learn that an officer who has had nine years' experience in the cavalry, the officer to whom I am surrendering command of this troop in two more days, should have so little grasp of leadership as to allow himself to be chivied into a go at fisticuffs while taps have barely sounded over a brave man's grave. God help this troop when I'm gone. Sir, it was my fault. You're at attention, Mr. Pennell. It was a misunderstanding, You'll Captain. oblige Miss Dandridge by getting back to troop area. Yes, sir. Mr. Cohill, you will have the men build their squad fires higher. Make the fullest show of bedding down here for the night. Then we're sneaking out, heading for the river. Is that clear, Mr. Cohill? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, Ross. Sorry, Flint. As usual, I had sent Sergeant Tyree to scout up ahead. And as usual, his eyesight hadn't failed him. Hostile, sir. A hold up in a ravine about three miles north of here. Only that ain't all. Well? They got visitors. Our old friend Rinders. Right smart of trading going on right now. Repeat and rifle. Mr. Rinders, huh? Oh, pass the word to Mr. Pennell. The three of us are going up to that ravine. The darkness helped us. We got to within maybe a hundred yards of the Indian encampment. They'd built a big council fire. There was Rinders and his friends bargaining with Red Shirt over the rifles in the wagon. Well, what's the argument now? Same thing, Reinders. Richard keeps saying that $50 a piece is too much. Too much, huh? Tell that grandson of a horse thief that I know he's got the money. Because he stole it from the paymaster's coat. Yo, Shiva, get the watch. Tell him I know he killed him, too. That it's $50 or no right. We saw a red shirt raise his hand, then a flash of knives. They dragged the white men, still living, and threw them on the fire. Join me in a chaw of tobacco, Sergeant? No, sir. I don't chaw and I don't play court. Chawing tobacco is a nasty habit. Been known to turn a man's stomach. Mr. Pennell? I, I'll take a chaw if you please, sir. Here. Now let's go. You still figuring on resigning, Mr. Pennell? No, sir. When we got back to the column, I called a meeting of the officers and sergeants. All present, sir. Uh, Any time between now and daylight, gentlemen, we can expect an attack. That means the case, the main column, is leaving here right now. We will leave a rear guard under one officer. Sir, I'd consider it a privilege if I Thank you, Mr. Purnell. Your offer to volunteer will go on your record, if you still wish to make a record. Mr. Cohill, two squads will remain behind. You will be in command. May I have the first and second, sir? The second squad has too many old married men. First and fifth, sir. You will cover our crossing and dig in. Yes, sir. Then pass the word and let's start moving. Lieutenant 
Fennell reporting, sir. The main column is safely across the river, all but you and Miss Dandridge, sir. Stand by. Mr. Cohill, as you know, this is the only crossing within 20 miles. So you've got to buy me some time. You've got to buy me a long day. Then we'll do it, sir. I know you will, Flint. Flint. Took you nine years to call me that, sir. And it was well worth waiting for. Well, you. we'll get you out of here, son. Just hang on. We'll get you out of this pocket by noon tomorrow. Mount your horse, Miss Dandridge. Flint. Flint, wait. Well, haul off and kiss her, blast you. We haven't got all night. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll be back, man. I'll be back. I promise you. Well, what are you waiting for, Mr. Pennell? Escort the lady across the river. If you'll follow me. Ross. I'm sorry, Ross. And I guess that's how it is. You and Flint. Yeah, sure. Good luck, Flint. Report can wait till later. Just thank heaven so many of you got safely back here to pool. It is my duty to report, Major Alshard. Mission of failure. Oh, fiddlesticks. It was our fault. You did everything as I have than never I worn a coat of whitewash yet, Abby, and I won't start now. I failed at Sudros. I failed to keep Rinder's rifles from the tribes, and I failed at everything. I leave the army a Failure. Now stop it. You're just running yourself down because... You... Blast it, Mac. Hasn't she told you I left Flint Cohill with two squads back at the Paradise? And a sound military move. So, with your permission, I'll start back. I'll have Cohill out of that pocket by noon tomorrow. No, Nathan. The troops can't leave till morning. Morning? They ought to pull out of here before midnight. Well, I'd agree if you were leading them. But Pennell will need all the daylight he can find. Pennell? That babe in the wood? Fording a river against a swarm of hostiles with Winchesters? Nathan... Aren't you forgetting something? You retire from the army tomorrow. Tomorrow is all I need. I can't leave Coyle facing those devils. It's It's... no one-day mission. This could go on for weeks. All right, then I'll volunteer as a civilian scout, interpreter, anything. And I thought you were fond of Coyle. Fond of him? Every time Coyle gave an order, men would turn around and look at you, wondering if he was doing the right thing. You want to ruin the boy? Oh, I know, Mac. Pennell's got to run his chances, too. We ran him, Nathan. That's what we get paid for. Yeah, I... I guess you're right, Mac. I, I guess you're right. Well, <clears throat> with your permission, then, I'll quit the post tomorrow. Permission granted, Nathan. Where will you go, Captain? Go? I don't know, miss. West, I guess. <clears throat> California, new settlements. <clears throat> Old soldiers, Miss Dandridge, someday you'll learn how they hate to give up. Captain of a troop one day and every man's face turned towards you. Lieutenants jump when I growl and now tomorrow I'll be glad if the blacksmith asks me to shoe a horse. Blast your eyes, Abby. If you start sniffling now, I'll... And as for you, young lady... I'm not crying. I... I'd like to stand up and cheer. At dawn the next morning, I reviewed the troops. My last review. They had a present for me. Watch and chain, solid silver, brought in special. St. Louis. It's, uh, it's engraved on the back, sir. Captain Brittles from C Troop, lest we forget. Lest we forget. We had hoped to hold a dance in your honor, sir, but under the circumstances... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You will do me one last favor, Mr. Pennell. Take your troop and proceed on your mission. Yes, sir. Forward! Yo! Good luck, C Troop. Good luck. Nathan, they'll get Cool Hill out of there. But that's not enough, is it, Mac? Within a week, those hostiles will be here on your doorstep. Then what? Oh, we'll take care of them. Yeah, well, I'll say goodbye. Oh, I left my other saddle in the cabin. Give it to Abby. Uh, 
It'll be easier on her uh, disposition. <laughs> Say goodbye to her for me, Mac. He'll do no such thing, Nathan Bribbles. Goodbye is a word we don't use in the cavalry. Now come here. Yes, ma'am. Until our next post, dear. Thank you, Abby. Once out of sight of the post, I swung east toward the Paradise River. I had a plan. I had witnessed Rinder's murder, but I had seen more than that. Among the Indians around that council fire, I had seen an old man. Pony that walks. I had known him from years before. Yes, I had a plan. And now, a brief intermission before our stars return with Act Three of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. I've chosen as our special guest tonight, Hollywood-born Leslie Banning, who is building a very successful career as a freelance actress. Uh, you've made a picture recently at RKO, haven't you, Leslie? Well, yes, I have, Mr. Keeley. But I haven't even seen the rushes yet. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. John Farrell, the director, told me you've done a splendid job. Well, that's good news, Mr. Keeley. You did better than my spy. And who was that? Jane Russell. She's my sister-in-law, Oh, you know. yes, of course. While Jane was working on Howard Hughes' production of His Kind of Woman with Robert Mitchum, I asked her to get some inside information, but she wouldn't talk. Uh, perhaps you should have asked Jane to sing. You know, she plays a sultry nightclub singer in search of romance, and naturally, she finds it with Robert Mitchum in this action-packed drama. Glamour and sophistication become this new Jane. Practically swooned over the gorgeous clothes she wears in His Kind of Woman. Nineteen different outfits. Hmm. And judging by appearances, uh, you yourself can face any clothes competition with distinction. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. You know, one of the reasons it's so easy to keep clothes looking wonderful is new Lux with color freshener. I've always loved Lux, but this new Lux is the most marvelous ever. Prints look wonderfully fresh, so alive, and colors, well, they practically sparkle. Even my lovely slips and nighties stay so gorgeous looking, I can hardly believe they've been washed at all. Jane and I both love it. A great many other Hollywood stars agree with you and Jane Russell. No other way of washing nice things leaves them fresher or brighter. Hollywood studios say new Lux with color freshener is a washing miracle. This amazing new Lux leaves white things dazzling white. Prints brilliant and gay. All colors dramatically new looking. Even delicate pastel slips and nighties renew their fragile beauty every time you Lux them. If you haven't tried New Lux with Color Freshener, you're in for a real thrill. Get a big box tomorrow. Use it for your washables to give them that nicest new Lux look. Thank you for coming tonight, Leslie Banning. It's been a pleasure, Mr. Kennedy. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> Curtain rises on Act Three of She Wore a Yellow Ribbon, starring John Wayne as Captain Brittles, Mel Ferrer as Lieutenant Cohill, and Mala Powers as Olivia. I was back with a troop by nightfall. An arrow, to my surprise, had affected the relief of Coal Hill's men without incident. And so far, the Indians had failed to make a move. There's a reason they've held off, sir. We've scouted them all day. They're concentrating forces. How many, Mr. Coal Hill? Close to a thousand, sir. Arapahoes, Kiowas, Comanches, and those Cheyenne dog soldiers. How much time have we got? What's your guess? Well, no time at all, sir, because we've got to hit them first. I'm glad the Major sent you, Captain. The men will feel a lot better about he it now. You didn't send me, Mr. Cohill. I am not on duty. Then the orders haven't been changed. Orders are orders, sir. But for the next four hours, according to my brand new silver watch and chain, I am still an officer in the United States Cavalry. Flint, if I gave you a written order, would you obey it? 
I don't need a written order, sir. Nevertheless, you're going to get it. It might come in handy in our court-martial. Sergeant Tyree? Yes, sir. I am ordering you to volunteer again. Yes, sir. You and me are going to ride out of here, Sergeant, just as soon as I write Mr. Cohill's orders. It's just a pencil, Flint, but I'm using all the official phrases. Yes, sir. You will remain here in your command, and don't force any action until I return. But if I don't, then read this piece of paper for your orders. Put it in your pocket. I understand, sir. And now, Mr. Tyree, if you'll find me a fresh horse, we'll take a little ride out toward those hills. Not that it's any of my business, sir, but may I ask where we're going? That's a foolish question, Sergeant. You know as well as I do. Yes, sir. To the Indian encampment. You aiming to powwow with red shirt, Captain? I'm not that crazy. No, sir. But there is a chief who might listen to us. Pony that walks. Ever hear of him? Yes, sir, but he's an old man. That makes two of us who've seen enough of war. Yes, sir. In case you don't know it, sir, that ain't a bird. Walk to your horse, Sergeant. Hold up your right hand. It's a peace signal. Let's hope they'll see it. And just over that ridge, Captain. Yeah. Ever been scared, Mr. Tyree? Yes, sir. Up to and including right now. We reached the crest and rode past their guards. They swarmed in on every side, warriors in full paint, crazy for blood. We forced our way through to the council fire. Their leaders, half a dozen of them, stood in front of us. Then Red Shirt fired an arrow at my feet. We come in peace. This Red Shirt knows. But he answers with an arrow before we can talk. I take his arrow from the ground. I break the arrow of Red Shirt. I spit on his arrow. I will speak with Pony that walks. Nathan, Nathan, I am Christian. Hallelujah. Old friend me. Long time, long time. I have come in peace, Pony that walks. Take salt, Nathan, take salt. It was plain that the old Indian was tolerated in the council only because of his years. Red Shirt was the leader of this army and nobody else. Red Shirt, very angry. Lily, she, she saw the... Kill. Kill. Much blood. Nathan, old friend, smoke pipe. Nathan, smoke, good. I smoke your pipe, but my heart is sad at what I see. Your young men painted for war. The medicine drum's talking. It is a bad thing. Many men will die. My young men, your young men, no good. We must no stop good. this war. The young men do not listen to me. They listen to big medicine. Yellow hair cost her dead. Buffalo come back. Great sign. Too late, Nathan. You come with me. We hunt buffalo together. Smoke many pipes. We are too old for war. Yes, we are too old for war. But old men should stop war. Too late. Too late. Soon many squaws sing death songs. Many lodges empty. You come with me. We hunt buffalo. Get drunk together. Hallelujah. No, old friend. I must go. I go far away. You will go in peace, Nathan. I put Manitou round neck. No harm. Wash Keola. Wash Keola. Wash Keola. It appears they're turning us loose, Captain. It's not enough, Sergeant. I had hopes of coming to terms. Terms? With them? One more failure to add to my... Is something wrong? No, nothing wrong. Just glanced to your left there. Kind of casual-like, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well? The ponies, hundreds of them. Hundreds of ponies in a gully where they can't wander off. But if something was to stampede those ponies... Stampede? Yes, sir. Back to camp, Mr. Tyree. On the double. (laughs) 
Lieutenant Cohill reporting, sir. Troops ready to move, sir. The men know their assignments. Yes, sir. The column in single file leading mounts. We are to follow you, sir, proceeding with the utmost quiet. Mm. There's the creek at the near end of that gully. We'll stop there and form ranks. Meantime, sir. Meantime, Mr. Cohill, just pray that the moon stays behind those clouds. Truth, Paul. Pass the word. Halt and pass the word. Halt pass the word. Halt pass the word. Mr. Cohill, can you read the time by my brand new silver watch and chain? Uh, yes, sir. Twelve minutes to midnight, sir. The gully lies straight ahead of us. On signal, we'll gallop through that draw and stampede the herd out the other end into their encampment. Questions, Mr. Cohill? No questions, sir. Mount and pass the word. Mount and pass the word. Mount and pass the word. Bugler? Sir? A count of three and sound the charge. Mr. Cohill? No casualties, sir. Hmm, no casualties. No Indian war, no court martial. You'll have a time rounding up those hostiles, Mr. Cohill, but they'll not get very far on foot. Take them back to the post, sir? No, back to the reservation. Have your soldiers follow them all the way. Stay about a mile behind them. Walking hurts their pride, and your watching will hurt it worse. Yes, sir. Can you read what time it is by my brand new silver watch and chain? Two minutes past midnight, sir. Uh, I've been a civilian for two minutes. Hard to believe. It's your army, Mr. Cohill. Good luck. Briggles just, um, just said goodbye and rode away. Is that it, Mr. Cohill? Yes, Major. We got the hostiles on the trail, sir. Then I left Lieutenant Fennell in charge and returned here to report, sir. So Nathan's finished with the Army, is he? Well, the Army isn't finished with him. Who's your best rider, Mr. Cohill? Why, Sergeant Tyree, sir. Then tell Sergeant Tyree I want to see him right away. Irie? It's been a half a week running you down. Here. If you think you're going to California, Mr. Tyree, no, you're... just bringing a message for you, sir. Huh? From a Yankee War Department by way of Major Olshaw. I knew it. Dad blasted, I knew it. Well, uh, where's my spectacles? Every time a man... Tyree. Look. Look what it says. It's my appointment, Chief of Scouts, with a rank of Lieutenant Colonel. And will you look at those endorsements? Bill Sheridan, William Tecumseh Sherman, and Ulysses Simpson Grant, President of the United States of America. There's three aces for you, boy. Yes, sir. I kind of wished you'd been holding a full hand. Huh? Full hand? What do you mean, full hand? Robert E. Lee. Oh. Well, it wouldn't have been bad. Let's get back, boy. Major, sir. He's coming up the steps now. Open the door, Quinn Cannon. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Brittles. Uh, uh, 
What's going on here, anyway? Just a dance in your honor, sir, to welcome you back. And I might add, you kept us waiting for some time. Well, I'm sorry I'm late, Mac, but I didn't even Don't know Don't apologize, until... Colonel. It's a mark of weakness. Oh, well, oh, proceed, Bandmaster, proceed. Old Iron Pants has a request to make. Your arm, Nathan. Thank you, Abby. And sir, sir... Yes, Mr. Callhill. You'd be surprised to know that Miss Dandridge and I are going to be... Why, son, I knew it all the time. Everybody in the post knew it above the rank of a second lieutenant. Right, Mr. Pennell? There'll come a time, sir, when I'll be a first lieutenant. Yeah, in, in ten, ten or twelve, twelve years. years. Will you stay for the dance, Colonel? Oh, if you'll excuse me, Miss Dandridge, I, I've got to make my report first. Colonel, wait. Here, please take these with you. Oh, I am obliged, ma'am. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Report? And your flowers. You gave him your flowers. I think they'll make someone else even happier, darling. His girl. So ends the story of Captain Brittles and the troops he led. The dog-faced soldiers, the 50 cents a day professionals, riding the outpost of the nation. From Fort Reno to Fort Apache, from Sheridan to Stockton. Men in dirty shirt blue, and only a cold page in the history books to mark their passing. But wherever they rode and whatever they fought for, that place became the United States. I hope you enjoyed the show as much as I did. Now I know you'll want to meet our stars personally, so in just a moment, Mr. Keeley will be back with them for a brief chat and to tell you about next week's show. But first, I'd like to give you my own experience with this wonderful new Lux with color freshener. I was so excited myself the first time I tried it, I could hardly believe my eyes. You know, here in Hollywood, we see so many wonderful things that when the stars themselves say it's the most marvelous thing that ever happened to their favorite Lux, you can be sure it's really sensational. And we're back here at Shadowlands. My name is Jack Ward here, your host for this evening. And we just finished listening to Tie a Yellow Ribbon, the old-fashioned and classic episode uh, from Lux Theater based on the famous movie starring uh, John Wayne. Coming up is another classic, of course, with Abbott and Costello. This uh, little gem I had discovered with Abbott and Costello, along with guests Lucille Ball and none other than Bugs Bunny. Stand by as Warner Brothers heads away with Bugs Bunny, along with Lucille Ball, and, of course, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. CKDU 97.5 FM. The Abbott and Costello program, brought to you by Camels, the cigarette that's first in the service. Listen to the music of Freddie Rich and his orchestra, Billy Gray as Little Matilda, Mel Blank is the famous Leon Schlesinger cartoon character Bugs Bunny, tonight's guest, Metro Golden Mayor star of the best foot forward, Miss Lucille Ball, and starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Costello, late as usual. Why, what kept you this time? Oh, I was waiting for a new letter carrier, Abbott. Yes? Yeah, and it turned out to be a dame. Boy, did I have trouble with her. And what kind of trouble? She tried to kiss me. Yeah, she kept right on kissing me on the eyes, on the nose, on the chin. Wait a minute. Why didn't she kiss you on the lips? Well, she's new at the post office, and she can't find the right zone. The right zone. <laughs> there you go again, Costello. 
I can read your mind like a book. All I can see is women, women, and women. Where did you turn the page for? You'll find some girls. Yeah, yeah, girls. <laughs> girls, girls, girls. Every night you're out late with girls. Last night you were out with two. Yeah, but I only caught one. No, 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 no. Why, no. was well, she beautiful? I met her down at the Lone Pond. King Johnny's joint. Oh. <laughs> was she a gorgeous aircraft worker? She was? What a fuselage. A fuselage. <laughs> That little aircraft worker did something to me, brother. No kidding. I took her in my arms. I felt the pounding in my chest. You mean your heart was beating? No, she forgot to turn off her riveting machine. No. <laughs> now, see here, Costello. You'll have to stop this. Either you stop going around with all these girls and talking about them all the time, or we're through. I didn't know you felt that way, Abbott. Yes. All right, I promise. I won't look at another girl if I live to be a thousand years old. Hello, my fat little sugar man. How time flies! <laughs> Gee, Connie, you look cute tonight. Do you really think so, honey? Yeah. Now I know what they mean by the solid south. Uh, uh, all right, Costello, look. Don't if, get it, eh? Now, all right, look. If you're so anxious to go out with girls, why don't you pick out some nice girl like Connie Haynes? Ah, uh, Connie won't go out with me. Yes, I will, Mr. Costello. I had a fight with my family tonight, and I want to disgrace them. Uh, <laughs> hey, what did I tell you, Abbott? There's no use. I'm surprised at you. Did George Washington give up at Valley Forge? He had a tough time. Never mind. Did Paul Revere give up? No, but Paul Revere had a horse she could depend on. Well, well, you've got me. I'd rather have the horse. I are. Well, Mr. Costello, I'll go out with you on one condition. If you all get me a pair of nylon stockings. A pair of nylon stockings? That's her deal. Now, now, don't be silly, Costello. You can't get nylon. Oh, can't. I can get one pair, two pair. I can get a dozen pair of nylon. That OPA hears everything. <laughs> Goodbye, my fat little sugar man. I'll see you at 8 o'clock tonight with a nylon. Gee, Abbott, I guess I talk too fast. Where am I going to get a pair of nylons? I want to go out with Connie Haynes. Well, why don't you be smart? Be nice to Mrs. Niles. That's right, Costello. My wife has a pair of nylon stockings. Now, wait a minute, Niles. You mean a dame with those ugly legs spends money for stockings? Well, now, what do you expect for her to wear? Hip boots. Yeah, hip boots. <laughs> Remark, Costello. Oh, well, if it isn't Mrs. Niles in the flesh. And I use the word loosely. <laughs> oh, you funny, funny man. And I use the word physically. <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing wrong with my legs. Why, I was once a ballet dancer. I used to kick my leg way up in the air. Yeah, and on the way down, you catch it. Now. <laughs> Well, why do you fight with Mrs. Niles? Her legs are very attractive. Are you kidding? Ah. She's so bow-legged, every time she runs, she looks like an egg beater. <laughs> Am legs... I insulting you? <laughs> My legs are perfectly straight, Costello. Look at them. They're just like arrows. Feathers and all. <laughs> Feathers. Of all the nerve. I'm not an old hen. Oh, no. Get back in your coop. Come on, get back in your coop. Stop that. Stop that, I said. Quick, 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 quick. Stop that, I said. Quick, 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 quick. will you please say something? Kenneth Niles, you come with me. Now, door slams. Never mind. No, no, no. Excuse me. Come here, Costello. I was written here. Never mind what's written there. Excuse me. Excuse me. Now, you've driven Mrs. Niles out of the studio again. Oh, pilot to navigator. Pilot to navigator. Sighted dame. Tank same. I think that's very funny, but I'm only three and a half years old. <laughs> it's little Matilda. Matilda, what are you doing out of school? My teacher sent me home because I kissed a little boy. You kissed a boy? Well, it wasn't exactly a kiss. We were eating the same liquid stick and I chewed past my head. <laughs> Now, look, Matilda, will you please go home? I can't. I'll get lost. Oh, no, you won't. The train stops at every station. Why does it stop at every station, Uncle Louie? Because it's a milk train. Do they have to milk it at every station? <laughs> How do you like a little kid? Three and a half years yeah. old. What's to know if you have to milk a train? Milk a station? train, milk a train. It's impossible. You, you can't milk a train. That's silly. How's he going to get a big train to sit on a little stool? Ah. Ah. Now, 
Now, look, Ma- Matilda, please. Don't worry, Uncle Louie. He's trying to get a pair of nylon stockings. You could get a pair of nylon stockings from my friend Betty Grable. Betty Grable? How do you know she has nylon? Because that's where I saw her put her money. The Bank of America never had branches like that. <laughs> Wait a minute, Matilda. Uh, maybe you can help Uncle Louie. Do you oh. really know Betty Grable? Yeah. Here's a picture of us on a bicycle. That's me on the handlebars. Mm-hmm. But uh, why have you got such a surprised look on your face? Cold handlebars. Cold handlebars. Back to Abbott and Costello and their search for nylon stockings. Well, Costello, I guess we came to the right place. Look at that sign. Square Deal, Biggle Bottoms, the happy. Oh, so happy store. Oh, yeah. no. uh, Costello, what was that? That was Beagle Bottom making a cheerful refund. That's <laughs> why. I wonder where the hosiery department is. Let's uh, ask this fellow over here. Uh, pardon me, mister. Are you the floor walker? What do you think I am with this carnation on a flower pot? <laughs> After all, I'm not a jerk, you know. Well, you're not trying. <laughs> Costello, don't antagonize the man. He might be able to help you, you know. Oh, I think you got something there, Abbott. Mister, please, mister. I wish you could do something for me. I gotta get a pair of nylons. We haven't any nylons, and stop licking my hand. <laughs> it's no use, Abbott. All right. Forget about the nylons and the date with Connie Haynes. Uh, just a moment, gentlemen. I can give you a tip on a real bargain. Uh, due to a slight oversight in our tailoring department, we have 4,000 pairs of three legged pants. <laughs> three legged pants? That's great. I'll tell all my three legged friends. <laughs> But don't tell them all. Remember, only one pair to a customer. <laughs> Come on, Abby, let's get out of here. I'm away from this guy. All Where? right, don't get excited. Wait a minute. We'll try the sales girl here. Oh, miss, uh, can you tell us where we might get a pair of nylons? Sorry, I can't help you. You see, I'm in long underwear. <laughs> Itchy, isn't it? <laughs> Stop insulting people. Now, there's only one, to get, one way to get those nylons, uh, Lou. Listen to me. We'll have to see uh, Mr. Beetlebottom. Personally, we've got to do this. Now, come on. Here's the elevator. Up, 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 up. That's enough. Up, 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 up. Cut it out. Have you tried baking soda? Uh, uh, look, never mind that. All right, folks. Step lively. Get a move on. Plenty of room on a second layer. Uh, are you going up? Yeah. What's up, Doc? What's cooking, Satchel? Costello, look. It's Bugs Bunny. <laughs> hey, Bugs. What are you doing, running an elevator? Well, I'm replacing a woman that's essential, Doc. Come on, stop wasting time. Get us up there. Okay, Doc. Come on up. <laughs> Go up too fast for your fat show? No, I always wear my pants at half mast. <laughs> Bugs, will you please let us out? Okay, Doc. Eight floor, chewing gum, chocolate bar, sweet cream, butter, T-bone steaks, and other picture postcards. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm going to murder this rabbit. Oh, no, no, don't pay any attention to him. Now, we've got to see Mr. Bigglebottom about those nylon stockings. There's, there's a secretary. Uh, pardon me, miss. Can we see uh, Mr. Bigglebottom? Okay, did you have an apartment? <laughs> an apartment? No. Then why did you want to see him a bird? I want to see him a bird some nylon stickers. <laughs> And just a moment down that second arrow. Oh, thanks. Come on, Herbert. Uh, what kind of talk is that? Well, uh, well, stop talking like that. Hurry up. We'll miss the sale. Here you are, people. Here you are. Nylon stockings. Nylon stockings. Hey, you. You over there. I'll take a pair. For selling. I'm buying. <laughs> I must be from Nancy's. <laughs> Hey, Costello, stop uh, pulling around. Look up at that sign there. One pair of nylons goes on sale in less than a minute. Hey, but there's 500 women ahead of me. Oh, what do you care? Go on, squeeze through. Oh, just a minute, young man. You can't squeeze in here. Okay, babe, let's go outside. <laughs> hey, yo, watch how you're talking to my mother. She's a pistol packer mama. What are you, one of the blanks? <laughs> what? <laughs> quiet, Costello. Is everybody quiet? 
quiet, please. Quiet. We are about to put on sale one pair of nylons. Remember, only one pair. The first one to get to the counter will receive the nylons and free medical attention. <laughs> All right, get ready now. All right, Fatso, you got to win this race, Doc. Hey, Buck, what are you doing on my back? I'm your jockey, Doc. How can I run fast with you on my back? Don't worry, I got a whip. <laughs> hey, hey, Fatso, your stirrups are loose. Take your feet out of my garter belt. <laughs>
Abbott and Costello will be back in just a moment. And now here's Abbott and Costello with the final word. Thanks, Ken. Well, folks, next Thursday is Thanksgiving. And Jane Wyman will be here to help us celebrate. And be sure to tune in, everybody. We won't have a turkey, but that Jane Wyman. What a chicken! Woo! Good night, folks. Good night. Good night, everybody at the Lone Pond. Woo-hoo! This is Ken Niles wishing you all a very pleasant good night from Hollywood. And it's a good night here in Halifax. My name is Jack Ward. You're listening to Shadowlands Theater, and I have here sitting beside me, of course, the ever undaunted Andrew Dorfman. How are you today, Andrew? <clears throat> that good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Why what? are you that good? No it's particular just, no, reason. No reason. No particular reason whatsoever. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Bugs tonight? He didn't quite sound... I didn't get a chance to really hear it. I've Unfortunately. I've been all over the place. Yeah, you were back and forth. We have uh, a couple of students in tonight from one of the Shadowland classes, actually. The next generation of Shadowlandians are in another studio recording one of their first attempts at radio drama. Yeah, and it sounds like a first attempt, too. Yeah, none of that. They're doing very, very well. Thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> I appreciate you, Andrew, for being able to help them out. It's uh, really good that you're able to provide your experience in the technical arena. That was a great sound effect. Yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> the technical arena, of course, Andrew is armed like a gladiator there, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, um, just a couple of notes here uh, coming up. I'm a Sherman tank. You're a Sherman tank. Coming I'm, up on I'm, the... Sh- oh, sorry. Coming up when? Coming up now, uh, we have the infamous fill-in show. It's always different. It's always an interesting person. We have the gentleman sort of chomping. We don't at the bit. have monkey nut. This we don't have monkey nut tonight for some reason. Um, I miss the monkey. Nuts. I miss the monkey nuts myself. Who are you? Jim Parks. Jim Parks. What's, what's the name sh- of your show? Oh, I didn't think of a name. It's the No Name it's Show. The, I didn't think of the name show. It sounds the, good to me. I can't believe it's a show show. <laughs> and it's less filling. Okay. Yes, I can't believe it's not real show. Okay, and after that we have, what do we got? After that fill-in show, we have, of course, the midnight fill-in show. And after the midnight fill-in show, we have the after midnight. After fill-in midnight show. fill-in show, often known as the all-nighter, from the two a.m. to seven a.m. I think we need more DJs, folks. So if you love the midnight show, actually the night. If you show, stay up overnight, anyway. Anyway, yeah. Listening to music. And wanting to talk to people randomly. Yeah. Come in and do some training. At Actually, it, it's really great because you have almost no stipulations on what you can and can't do on the midnight show. After all, we have we have certain requirements here. We have certain Canadian content standards. requirements that we have to adhere to. However, if you are in between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., you can pretty much get away with anything. Speaking of, you know, we'll talk about requirements and, and standards in a minute because I want to talk about deep throat. But moving right on, I we requirements have requirements and standards <laughs> and deep throat. That's right. Seven a.m. next morning after the all nighter is flapping. It, come on, work with me here. Flipping. Paul McCartney and uh, Yoko Ono. <laughs> no, no, that was John Lennon. <laughs> A bird Paul flaps McCartney his feathers uh, on a and a prayer. Elvis, uh. I know <laughs> you're going to keep coming. Up. Okay, wings, wings is coming up at seven a.m. Seven thirty, the CKDU News Collective. We will be assimilated. Uh, Nine a.m. is a 
fill-in show at 10 a.m. the time of useful consciousness of course it takes till 10 a.m. before you have useful consciousness <laughs> but there you go at 10 30 confluence... okay we're going way too far confluence with trish no you have to go up to noon what 10 30 confluence with trish turlick and at noon democracy now then i see you start off with the evening you give them the nobody twist. else goes till 10 till noon the next day i am i am very very uh specific you know anal I'm, okay whatever we'll go with that so speaking of that let's get back to deep throat um deep oh, throat whoa Deep Throat. There was a logical jump there that, <laughs> I know. that did all sorts of nasty things with I my brain. I thought I could do that to you. Deep Throat has finally been an, has finally been uh, identified. Do you know that? No. No? Deep Throat. Yes, you do, because we talked about this earlier. You're lying, lying hound. Yeah, but I try to forget about everything you say because <laughs> it just hurts my brain. Well, Deep Throat was apparently a uh, CIA... No, not a CIA. He was an FBI... Uh, Mark Felb, a former deputy associate director of FBI, he was the source that provided the newspaper with some of his biggest scoops through the water, Watergate scandal. I know we're running out of time. I just want to point this out because I think it's it's an amazing thing because today, if we had a deep throat today talking about what was going on in the American government, what would you think would happen? There'd be a sex scandal. <laughs> It'd be a sex scandal. But no, if if somebody came out and and got those. Now I've gone blank. What are the uh, what are the two? Woodward and Bernstein. Thank you, Woodward and Bernstein. If Woodward and Abbott Bernstein and came, Costello. Abbott and Costello came out, they'd be they'd be hauled off to Guantanamo Bay, wouldn't they? I don't know. Yeah, they would. They, they're a little too white for Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> I think they would go. Someplace. I think Guantanamo Bay is reserved for Cosimo people. or what is? It? Yeah, I think Guantanamo Bay is reserved for only people of non-white descendant. Oh, so they go to Kokomo Bay. Or something yeah. Is what you're saying. yeah, they go to Club Med Club only Med. with barbed wire. Barbed wire and Kokomo Bay. Now I, I'm trying to find. By the way, I, I'm running out of time quickly, but I was trying to find, you know, any kind of events. Do you have any events there you want to? Yeah, throw in I've first? got. Uh, uh, Wednesday, June first, I've got an all ages with Sarah McLaughlin and the Parishers That's at tomorrow. the Metro Center. Yep. Uh, on the fourth, we've got the Wasabi Collective in the Attic at uh, oh, eleven p.m. Else is what going. is it? What is the Wasabi Collective? It's like a jam band from Vancouver, I think. I don't know they're really good. They have like one woman that like plays all like percussion in a drum machine and. Oh, cool. It's cool. And then on Saturday, June the 11th, it's Slayer Day, War Ensemble at the Attic at 11. Slayer Day? Yeah. You're supposed to, like, dress up like Buffy or something? I have no idea. I, I don't know either. Maybe anyway, maybe so band. go there, check it out, have a good time. So you were saying about uh, about uh, Woodward and Bernstein being... Yeah, if they were around today, do you think that they would have had the kind of, you know... They, would they be celebrated as journalists today if they came out with the same kind of scandal that was going on in today's government? I don't think so. I, I read the blogs, and the people who are you know supporters of the president, which is obviously the majority of Americans who voted. <laughs> yeah, okay. Majority of Americans who voted. Right? The majority of Americans who who were who voted. Sort of. Sort of. Okay, well, you we don't want to get into Diebold there or yeah. Diebold. How do you pronounce that? D I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, the, the, we don't want to get into who that kind of scandal. Who we told voted. Yes, who who were told voted, you know, had gone for that. They, You know, they talk about people like Woodward and Bernstein today, people who are, you know, considered whistleblowers. They're calling them just, just disloyal, totally disloyal. So how does this apply to Canada? No idea. Well, we were talking about this earlier. I actually do remember this. Do you? What did I yeah, say? Yeah, you were saying about the liberal tapes. And oh, that. right, right, right. Yeah, because there's there's a liberal. Thank you. You know, it was a liberal um, member. No, see, so I try not to remember what you say, but I can't help it. It was a conservative member, a conservative member of parliament, which was called up by some liberal caucus guys who asked who asked them over the phone. They basically <clears> said, "Look." Cross the floor, join us in this vote, you know, and we'll remember you. In fact, I think their exact words were, the Liberal Party is a very welcoming party. We roll the rug out, and trust me, it's full of fur. 
Okay. I don't know what that's supposed to so, mean. So, but yeah, it, the idea basically was what's this. What's the big deal? The big deal is that he's, you know, they wanted to uh, entice him to leave his political fold to come over, and they would give him something like a cabinet position, like yeah. Linda Stronic, okay, or Scott Bryson. So what's or the big deal? Like it's against uh, everything that they've made up there. I don't know. It's some sort the of hell it is. conflict. It's fucking politics. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can you say fucking at this time? Of day? It's 1030. Okay. I can say fucking. Fair enough. Just we, you didn't contextualize it's, it. It's politics. I want to say, first of all, that warning, anything Andrew says can and will be offensive to anyone who listens to it. Strong language and it will last approximately whenever he comes to the microphone. Please go ahead. It's politics. Yes, it is politics. It's There is no straight shooting in politics. Politicians are liars, thieves, and occasionally intelligent. But mostly, they are based on screwing other people. There's only two, two professions in this world that are based on screwing people. Politicians and prostitutes. Both begin with P. Strangely, strangely enough. Now, speaking of uh, politicians and being political, I did promise that some of the students would come in and say hello before we leave, and we're all over already over time. So can you just make sure that they come in and say hi before we head uh, off? I already sent our uh, intern. In our, our sent our intern off. In the meantime, let me say goodnight for myself and Andrew Dorfman. I'm going to put on the music, and they'll say goodnight afterwards. And then we'll head into the fill-in show, which is the show that we have no idea what a name is for. The, the I Can't Believe It's Not a Show. That that's the name. I can't I believe it's not it a tiger. show. What's that? Just call it Tiger Show. Tiger Show? Yeah. Is that like... With a Y? Is that like... Or a G? Do I pronounce it with a Y or tiger, an I? Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Bright in the Forest of the Night? No, no. Tiger, Tiger, where's Burning Bright. Oh, Tiger with an I. Tiger with an I? Well, where's Ooh. the Y in Tiger? Where's the Y in Tiger? That's a perfect name for There's a, show. a good question. Where's the Y in Tiger? Where's the Y in Tiger? Thank you very much for listening. This is Jack Ward. You're listening to Shadowlands. Be here no, again next week. I don't week. know. I don't think they're going to make it. Hold on. Shadowlands Theatre is produced and directed weekly by Andrew Dorfman and Jack Ward. Be here next week as we explore original and classic radio drama. Look for upcoming episodes and schedules for Shadowlands through the station's website or at www.shadowlandstheatre.com. See you next week at this time in the Shadowlands. Until then, I'm Jack Ward. Good night.